Thanks for joining my presentation. My name is William Chang, and I'm the core team and founding member of OpenAPI Generator. Today, I want to share with you how we scale the test coverage of OpenAPI Generator to support more than 30 programming languages in our project so far. The agenda for today's presentation. To start with, we'll talk about what is uh, the OpenAPI Generator. Then we'll talk about how, how we test uh, so many generators that we support in our projects. And then we'll talk about how we scale the test coverage as well as how we scale the community. At the end, we'll have the Q&A. A little bit about myself to start with. Um, I'm the core team and founding member of uh, OpenAPI Generator. And I happen to be the top contributor to this project so far. Um, I've been working on this project for more than five years. Uh, with thousands of commits, millions of live code changes. And I also published several ebooks with uh, uh, different languages such as uh, Japanese, Chinese, English, French on uh, code generation. Please feel free to grab a copy to support my work. And uh, I'm also the founder of a company called uh, westunited.com, which makes it much easier for uh, developers to generate SDK, uh, documentation, and code samples for the REST APIs in only five steps. And uh, I was previously working at Morgan Stanley, and here are my the, uh, GitHub and Twitter handle. So what exactly is Open API Generator? As illustrated in the diagram here, it is as simple as the process that takes some sort of input in the form of YAML or JSON and then we'll generate something useful for you, such as uh, open API clients in different languages, documentations, and more. For the input, we support open API specification, which is formerly known as Swagger. We support version 1.2, 2x, and 3x. So let me show you what the uh, open API specification 2.0 looks like. As you can see, this is for one particular endpoint. Uh, this is the URL, it's a get method, we have a text to classify this endpoint, description, and then uh, for this endpoint, the server will produce either XML or JSON payload. For parameters, it's expecting something in the path parameter here, and it needs to be integer 64. If the operation is successful, it will return a pet object back to you. And for security, you need to pass the API key. So this is for OpenAPI specification 2.0. And for 3.0, as you can see, it looks uh, very similar, right? We also have the URL here. Uh, we have get method, description, parameters. Uh, one major difference is that now, so we describe this payload in the response, right? If it is successful, it's 200. Then uh, for we have two different uh, types of payload, XML or JSON. So either way, you get by a pet object. We also have the same security annotation here to indicate it requires API key authentication. And for the process for Open API Generator itself, there are different ways to uh, to use it. Uh, you can include it directly in your Java applications uh, as a jar dependency. Uh, you can use it as a CLI as a command line tools. Uh, if you're using uh, Brew. You uh, in Mac OS or Linux, you can simply type boo install open API dash generator to install it for you. Uh, if you do not want to install uh, Java as a dependency in your machine, you can use our public uh, REST API server by simply issuing a HTTP call to generate the, uh, the code for you. If you are using uh, Docker, uh, we have published some images to the uh, Docker Hub under the Open API Tools uh, ID. So we have published uh, something for CLI and also the uh, REST API server, so you can host it locally in your uh, internal environment. So for CLI, we have achieved 1 million downloads already. I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty good. And we have also uh, another way to do it, which is uh, using the uh, NPM package manager. Uh, this is, I think, one of the very popular method. Uh, if you go to our uh, page here, if you type uh, the npm install at openapi tools openapi-generator-cli, 
you will be able to install it very easily. We also add something called a version manager that you can uh, set the version very easily. Uh, so you can just simply roll back to a very old version uh, without much effort. So we have achieved 110,000 weekly downloads so far. I think it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty good, pretty active. Uh, if you're using something like Maven or Gradle plugins, we also have plugins available. Uh, if, you're, if you want to do it right from your IDE, uh, for example, Eclipse, React Code, we also have plugins available for that. So for the output, uh, we support uh, more than 30 programming languages, many server-side frameworks, API documentations. You can also convert your open API specification into GraphQL schema, protocol buffer, uh, and more. Uh, you can also change it into uh, Apache web server config, or you can also generate schema directly. So we have something called MySQL DB schema generator that you can try it out. For a full list of uh, output that we support, uh, please go to our GitHub page. And then uh, you can uh, just go down a little bit. And uh, here we have up the sponsor section in the overview section, you can see we have list all the language framework that we support uh, for popular languages, Java, C Sharp, TypeScript supported. For some not so popular languages, uh, uh, Haskey, uh, Ada, Apex, uh, even Bash, right? or even Action Script. So we still support this. Um, and also uh, documentations, uh, config files, schema. Uh, so you can find all the latest uh, that we support right here. So you may wonder who are actually using Open API Generator in production. Uh, there are actually many companies and open source projects that are already leveraging Open API Generator. Here are some of them: Agoda, uh, Datadog. For companies in Japan, we have Sony Interactive Entertainment, Yahoo Japan, and Kubernetes is also using Open API Generator. For a full list, you can go to this website, openapi-generator.tech, and you can find a full list here. Feel free to add your companies to this list if you are using it in production. You can simply do so by going to our GitHub page. And uh, so scroll down a little bit to this one, companies watch out using Open API Generator, and add your company to this list. To this list. I hope by now you have a better idea of uh, what Open API Generator does and how it can help you. In the following, we are going to talk about two things. How do we test and how do we scale? Um, here is what the test looks like uh, on day one. On the left-hand side, we have the uh, Open API specification 2x or 3x uh, test files in YAML or JSON format. We have the Open API Generator written in Java. For the output, we have uh, API clients in uh, several languages such as Ruby, Java, PHP, and Python. For the test input, uh, we are using the Open API specification 2x and 3x uh, files in YAML or JSON format for testing. Uh, for 2.0, we have uh, more than 50 uh, files with uh, more than 30,000 lines. And for 3x, we have more than 100 files with about 25,000 lines. And moving forward, we'll be focusing on the Open API 3.0 test uh, as it goes mainstream. And uh, we'll not be uh, spending time on the Open API 2.0 test. I think it shouldn't be a surprise that we add the uh, unit test uh, to, for the Open API generator modules, just such as the CLI, um, online generator, Maven plugins, core, and more. We also add unit tests for generators such as Ruby, PHP, and their corresponding master templates. Here is what the default code gen test uh, looks like. So we try to test to make sure the form parameters have certain default values. It loads the spec to start with and then process it 
and then do the assertion. For language generator, such as the uh, Ruby kind generator, uh, we are performing something similar. We load it back, new the generator, perform certain operations, and then ensure the output files contains uh, what we are looking for. To ensure the auto-generated client, such as Ruby and PHP, works as expected, we have added the integration test uh, to test the API clients with a REST API test server. For example, we will make a GET request to the test server to make sure we get back something that we expect. We have added this test for the PHP, Ruby, Python, and Java clients. To show you what the integration test looks like, and here is the test for PHP. Uh, for this method, we are going to test the get path by ID with the HTTP info. So we are going to specify the ID, and then we are going to check out the functions, and we are going to assert uh, the returns is what we are looking for. And we're going to inspect the payload, uh, every fields one by one. We are going to check the HTTP header as well. I think so far so good. We have added uh, unit tests for the open API generator modules. We have added integration tests for various uh, API kinds. What about using this thing called contingent integrations? We are going to run the test in the Travis CI, which offer free continuous integration services for uh, open source projects. We are going to run this test against a public REST API test server to ensure that the API clients are functioning normally. And here is what the, uh, what the Travis CI looks like. So we have a list of jobs here, uh, triggered by pull requests or changes to the master. And if the job fails, it will show that oh, something's wrong. And if it succeeds, uh, that means uh, we have all the tests run successfully. Also, as part of the uh, integration workflow, uh, we published the snapshot version to Maven or to Docker Hub uh, to make it easier for our users to try out the latest master. But here comes the challenges. We need to add more tests in the module itself for the integration tests in the auto-generated clients. And we have added more and more client generators, Perl, TypeScript, Haskell, you name it. More server generator as well, Ruby and Rails, Rust, ASP.NET Core, and more. And we also start covering other types of generators, documentation, schema converters. And what about the language versions, right? Ideally, we want to test against uh, JVM 7, 8, 11 as well, right? To make sure the auto generated clients works with a uh, different type of JVM. What about uh, testing the clients in particular platforms? We want to test the Swift clients in Mac OS, C Sharp clients in Windows for sure. And here comes the problems. As we add more and more tests to the projects, Travis CI timeout because the jobs take more than 15 minutes to complete. So the job will never finish, right? It will always fail. What are we going to do? And how do we test Windows or Mac-based clients, right, such as C Sharp or Swift? Travis CI does not offer any Windows-based image at the moment. Uh, I think the PVC did offer the Mac-based uh, image, but we test it out and uh, we got uh, some other issues. So how are we going to handle different OS, different platforms? And since we are using single public REST API server to start with, if there are multiple PLs open at the same time that trigger multiple builds, testing against the very same test server, uh, most of the time it will fail. And for the public module repository, we find that it's trying to throttle the connection from us because the project was just so active. There's so many um, awesome contributors uh, submitting PLs to add features or bug fixes. These public modules just simply further our connection and saying, you know what, they cannot allow us to download things. Uh, using caching may possibly solve the problems, but uh, 
from time to time we find that uh, there are photo connections and uh, website uh, resetting our connections does not allow us to install dependency or tools for testing. And most importantly, because it's an open source project, we don't have any budget, right? To, uh, to, to, to try the commercial offering by Travis CI, which should solve some of these problems. So what are we gonna do? One way to address these problems is to scale out the CIs. As uh, Travis CI is not the only one providing free services for open source projects. So we use other CI providers such as CircleCI, Shippable, Joan.io, and GitHub Actions, right? So that we can check out all these uh, test workflows in parallel so that it won't exist the, uh, uh, the 30 minutes uh, uh, time interval set by Travis or other CI providers. And for different OS platforms, uh, AppWarriors, uh, we find that it offers window-based testing, uh, bitrace.io, uh, we find that it offers uh, uh, testing for uh, Swift clients. So we test Swift 4x and 5 clients in uh, bitrace.io. And uh, we are going to want a local REST API server inside the CI so that there will not be any race conditions, right? They can test with their own server, everything is good, right? All these tests are isolated. And to test the different JTK version, for example, right? Uh, for example, we in Travis, we install JTK 8, right? So that all the tests will be one against uh, JTK version 8. And for Circle CI, we're going to use, for example, JDK 11, so that uh, we can test JDK 11 as well to make sure the, for example, for example the Java clients uh, also works in multiple JDK versions. And now there's another challenge. And now we have more contributors joining, which is a good thing, right? We welcome them to submit PRs, open any issues to help us move the project forward. From time to time, they ask, how do, how do they contribute a new generator? They want a generator in Rust, maybe in Visual Basic or something else. How do they do that? And now we have so many PRs to reveal, right? Every day, people submit a PR house. Right? Every day, people open an issues. How are we going to handle that? And you know what? Some PRs accidentally remove some tests. Or well, simply just wipe up all the test files for a particular class. How are we going to handle that? And here are a few tips to onboard new contributors to your projects. First of all, uh, prepare a release checklist. So what exactly is that? So here, when I try to submit a pull request, so I will have this template uh, populate the content of the pull request. Um, the comment explain what we are looking for, and here is the checklist. Uh, make sure people read the contributing guidelines. Uh, make sure people clearly describe the PR. And uh, if they are making changes, uh, quick changes, then make sure they update the samples so that the CI can test the change and also copy the uh, technical committee, for example. So this is to make sure the PR is ready for review. Uh, so this is what the PR looks like if it's ready. So we have all these items completed. So this will put everybody on the same page and we don't need to actually go back and forth to ask users, hey, can you do this? Can you update the sample? Uh, can you copy uh, the committee, for example? So this makes everybody's life easier in terms of the one who submit the PRs and also in terms of the one who review it. And treat your new contributors like VIPs, right? Because uh, if they have a very good experience to contribute their first PR, it's more likely they will come back and contribute more enhancements to your projects. And one, one good starting point is use other PRs as a reference. Right, show them, hey, if you want to make changes or fix something, this is the one that's very similar that you can use as a starting point. For example, if someone wants to sub, uh, create a new generator, right, uh, the best way is to look for, oh, how do we create other generators to start with? 
let's say so previously we add a C plus uh, plus Unreal Engine four kind generator. So if someone want to add another C plus plus generators uh, for kinds, then I think one very good starting point is this particular PR, right? So we can show them this is a good starting point. They can, for example, click on files changes, uh, so that they know um, what file I expect to be add, right? What files I expect to modify, how they're going to test it, right? So it's much easier to show them, hey, what this will be done, right? To add a new generator this way. And try to help them to get the new generators or new changes as soon as possible, right? By that, I mean, uh, you can test test it locally, you can test their PR locally, you can help them to fix minor issues in their PRs so that at least uh, the generator compiles and also the output uh, meet the uh, MVP requirement, minimal viable product requirement. So that is ready for testing, right? Because we want to get it out as soon as possible so that the community can test it out, right? So previously when we, for example, add the PowerShell generator, we want to just uh, uh, add the uh, MVP version so that we can uh, work out collect feedback from the PowerShell community, right, to further improve on the generator. And uh, we can also help them to set up tests uh, for them uh, in CI because it's, uh, it's, it's not easy for new users to understand how we test our projects. We have so many CI, we have so many different clients, different server generators. Uh, so we try to help them to take care of this for them so that they don't need to worry about testing, right? They only need to focus on the generator and then we can just get things going this way. Uh, do the contributors need to know Java in order to make a contribution to this project? Let's say creating a new generator. The answer is no. This is how the worst kind generator was created. So this engineer was from Google. He is asking, hey, why he's deep diving in the Java code right now? Is he supposed to uh, just uh, focus on Rust? Uh, so our answer is, yeah, just like previously, how we work out the PowerShell generators. Uh, so they, they only need to create the PowerShell uh, pestle samples, and then we can use uh, the, uh, the output that they create, and then we do the reverse engineering to create back the uh, generator as well as the template. That's how it works. And then uh, he's happy to contribute the worst uh, clients, and then we just reverse engineering that, and then we create the first version of the worst client generator successfully. Uh, without the uh, contributor knowing anything about Java, right? So they don't need to write a single line of Java, and they can still create a generator. And this is the experience I think that uh, that would welcome these users to come back and contribute more because this makes their life so easy. Uh, so they don't need to worry about other things. They can just focus on a particular language and we just take care of everything for them. After reviewing so many PRs, uh, here are some tips on how to better review the PRs um, contributed by your community. First and foremost, Understand the change. Understand what it does. Is it trying to fix something? Is it trying to add a new features? If it does not have a good description, ask the user to revise it. Ask the user to provide more information so that you can make a better judgment on whether to merge the PR or not. Ask good questions to the PR submitter. How can you reproduce the issue locally? Have they been actually using this fix? Have they tested it locally? Are they using this fix in their production environment? This will give you a better picture in terms of this fix. Is it mature enough to be merged in the master? You can also pay with the change locally. You can always pull this change uh, to your local machine and you can just compile the project, try to use the fix, try to test it locally. You can also try to break it try to cover edge cases not yet fixed by this uh, particular PR. It's also good to build a community of reviewers. So this is what we call the technical committees. So in the uh, project with me, uh, there's a session called Open API Generator Technical Committee. Anyone who submit uh, free PRs merged into master are eligible to join. 
So if, if someone uh, submitted a PR, let's say for a C sharp client, so we will copy the C sharp technical committee and which is based on language. So if someone submitted a PR for the C sharp server generator, we'll copy the same people as well. And some of these uh, reviewers are actually very active and we even give them an invite so that they can merge the PRs directly without the intervention from the core team. And uh, try to release often, right? Try to review the PR often, try to release it often. Uh, contributors do not want their PRs to sit there for a year before it get reviewed. So that, uh, that's why it's important to have other people try to review the PRs, right? Because there's no way several people can just review so many PRs to the projects. Try to release it often. When we have the bi-weekly patch release, I think we also have the bi-monthly minor release and a yearly major release, which I think works pretty well for the community so far. Uh, for your project, you may need to change it a little bit, but the idea is uh, you need to release it often to keep your users engaged. Contributors do not want to see their uh, changes, their fixes to be included in a release a year later, right? Because that would be too long to, for them to, to get a to get fix. And what about tests that got removed as part of PR? So sometimes people accidentally remove those tests, right? They try to wipe out all the test files and then we generate the test. So to attempt to, to, attempt to fix it, uh, the first approach is we try to restore the test file from a particular folder. So we try to copy some of the tests to a particular folder. As part of the CI workflow, we try to restore these test files and copy this into the current folder. Right, so this some this this works somehow, and uh, we are able to at least uh, ensure the tests are there, are present, as part of the continuous integration. But the problem is, is pretty kind of intuitive to the contributors that they need to update the test file in another folder, right? Instead of the one that they use to test the client. So here comes our second attempt. So we actually now monitor the test files instead. What I mean by that is, so we have a config file like this. So we are going to monitor the C-sharp test files uh, and the image for upload. So we are going to specify the test file here. So this file contains some menu tests that we have written so far. If anyone change it, let's say they remove the test, right? So the sharp S256 uh, will be different. Right? You have a different value here. If let's say compete, someone completely remove this file, so we will notify as well because now the value is not, not the same, right? The file because the file is gone. So this way we will be notified whenever people make changes to the test files. Even if people add a new uh, test case, which is a good thing, uh, so we'll get notified as well. At least we can get notified and do something about it. Instead of reviewing a PR that changes a lot of files and potentially spot that one little changes that we move the test file or test case. Last but not least, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor for their financial contributions to this project. You can also find the sponsor list in our project with, uh, with me. Uh, so our sponsor are Namesaw, Lightbulb, Docspin, Data, and Felix. We also would like to thank GoDaddy, Linux, Chatly for sponsoring the VPS, domain name, as well as the monitoring. And if you also find this project uh, useful to your work or personal projects, please consider uh, doing a uh, financial donation. Uh, you can go to our Open Collective pages uh, or just search for Open Collective Open API Generator and then you can consider making a donation uh, one time or on a monthly basis. Please also start our project in our GitHub page. We have 7K so far, and we have about uh, 1,700 1, contributors who have made changes to the project so far. And we look forward to the PR from you to help make these uh, projects better. 
And we sincerely hope that you will find this project uh, useful uh, to your work or personal projects. Thank you. And here are the credits. Uh, a huge thank to all the awesome contributions from our contributors. Uh, there are now more than 1,600 contributors to this project, and we look forward to the PLs from you as well. And the presentation template, as well as the icon and images from these parties. Thank you for your time for attending this presentation. I hope you find it useful. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me at uh, Twitter or my email address listed in my GitHub profile page. And I think you can also ask questions here in the chat room. So, thank you.